Okay, so good morning again, and after such an interesting lecture, uh, <laughs> I will now talk about more practical uh, uh, things, uh, which is actually the softer side of reprap printing, uh, filament printing. So I'm going to present you uh, w my contribution to the uh, printing uh, uh, ecosystem uh, community and uh, we will later see some practical problems and solutions uh, about printing so whoever of you uh, already prints or is going to play with these printers uh, will probably learn how to get better results uh, so uh, this well this is a 3d printer just like one of the many variants available uh, just to uh, just to summarize what you already know very well you have a you have motors that move a tool in a space you have an extruder motor uh, which pushes filament down you have a he heating element over here that melts filament and then you have for example or you might uh, also not have it a heated bed these are the basic components of a 3d printer all of these components are controlled by an electronic board which is uh, located on the printer itself uh, this board receives instructions from a computer actually there are some printers uh, with SD card readers where you put the instructions on board on the uh, on the printer itself this is the usual setup so you have a computer which sends instructions and electronics converts them to the uh, to the inputs for the uh, okay and of course you have a human at the beginning of the tool chain uh, so this is the tool chain you start from a 3d model sorry uh, from a 3D model and you can get a 3D model from either downloading some read ready material or by designing your uh, your own one or by scanning some physical object then you feed this 3D model to CAM, so-called CAM software CAM software is the so-called slicer, slicer software it's a general term I just uh, changed one letter to name my, my own and uh, the CAM software prepares data that uh, is uh, contained in a G-code file G-code file is a set of instructions used uh, to control the electronic board on the printer which then controls the uh, uh, items, the components of the printer itself so this is what happens in a, uh, when, you, when, you, when you do a print uh, CAD software is for drawing, for design computer-aided design and CAM software is for manufacturing these are the two steps for example CAD software is AutoCAD, SketchUp, OpenSCAD and many, many others programs w that let you design things CAM software is for example Slicer and okay others uh, <laughs> uh, you draw something in your CAD software you get a 3D model you put it into your CAM software, you get uh, instructions that are specific to that machine and to that machining strategy. So you have specific CAM software for, uh, for mills, for 3D printers and for other kind of CNC machines. And uh, each CAM software is configured with the capabilities of that machine, of that material, so it's specific to the process you're going to do. Um, well, the uh, slicer is. Uh, I'm now going to list the available uh, so, uh, software, um, software packages for 3D printer for low-cost 3D printers. Slicer is a free, free is free software. It's a, it's it got a lot of features, uh, which is actually my main goal to to provide the community with many many features to let people experiment and then contribute back with their feedback on ideas and fit and uh, and results. Uh, and it is strongly community driven. I'll talk about this later. Uh, there is Cura uh, also available. It is free software. It is easy to use because it's uh, spe it's, it is specifically optimized for <coughs> Ultimaker printers. Uh, Ultimaker response in current development and it's derived from an old one which is called Skinforge uh, so it's basically a uh, Skinforge with, with a, a speed boost applied and some uh, nicer graphical interface there is also Kistlicer which is quite popular but is known free software you haven't got the source code re re available uh, there is also Netfab which is known free and even price you have to pay for it you have to buy a license for Netfab uh, there is also MakerWare which is actually used only on MakerBot printers it's the software that MakerBot started building upon Skinforge in this case too uh, to, to have a proprietary uh, solution for their printers and then there are other things 
which are in the drawer of uh, old memories. And uh, well, my, my story starts from uh, my architectural background. Uh, I was in need of a cheap technique to make architectural models. And this was the last one that I got printed from a professional 3D printing service. They, uh, they used a Z-Core printer, those printers uh, which use powders and cost uh, tens of thousands uh, euros. Uh, and you get these very fragile models and you have to pay uh, even more to get them painted with some resin to avoid uh, the powder to, um, to, to come out in your hands. Uh, so uh, I paid for this one which is uh, 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters, uh, more than 1,000 euros to get this printed. Uh, so uh, it, it's not very convenient. Uh, you cannot use uh, such a pricey solution in a in a designing process where you need maybe to make more than one and then see it, discuss it, and then make another one. So I found the Reprap community online, and I bought a kit and I built my my first printer and I started getting my first results like everyone else uh, but at the time there was it was not entirely my fault it was mostly my fault of course as a new user but there was a complex to use software uh, a very complete and working software I have to say but very complex to configure with many options and uh, it was very slow it, it took a mm, lot of time to process a print to prepare a print uh, it had no visual preview just a, a long list of s numerical settings uh, and it had too many options with uh, uh, apparently uh, no, no meaning uh, because they are uh, ratios between things that a, a user actually can measure physically so uh, uh, the process was by trial and error and I got the best results by putting random numbers and don't touching them when, uh, <laughs> when they found a good balance even if they actually uh, were not corresponding to the physical reality. Um, and one more problem was that code, the source code for the software, which is free software, is very hard to, to read, hard to touch, uh, hard to fix, and very hard to add, add new features, which is what I, I basically needed for architecture. I, I was looking for something that optimized material usage because I needed aesthetical uh, presentation models uh, with no mechanical uh, strength at all. So uh, I, I didn't need to have an architectural model full of plastic. So I wanted to add, uh, op for example, optimization features. And it was impossible to put my hands over there. So, uh, well, this was the situation. Um, uh, actually, uh, the, the, limit, the lim limitations of the software itself were a problem for the entire community. A problem. Were a bottleneck. Were the, were, were the reason for I, uh, for, for, for not uh, experimenting in many uh, new branches because people had to, uh, to, to, to of course, to, to use what was available and uh, mechanical experiments were limited by uh, a software not coping with the speed of such experiments. Uh, when I, after some months I released, some months after I released Slicer uh, on the Repra blog, uh, Neil Underwood, a uh, core developer of Repro Project, posted this uh, announcement. He managed to, to, to print this model at uh, 10, 10 micron layer height. Uh, and this was a great achievement for Repro community uh, because it resembles it resembled, uh, powder printing as such small layers, you can't even see them if the mechanical structure is good. Uh, this was possible because Slicer was uh, incidentally faster than the previous one. So uh, you could uh, try something and change a little value, retry, change a little value, retry. If you had to wait hours between one print and the other one just to prepare the next one, the process would be was uh, too long and you uh, would uh, never uh, reach uh, such a difficult calibration. So my initial goals were to have a faster processing software to have clean code, clean source code, so that any programmers could put their hands in and uh, uh, learn and contribute, add features, fix things, 
uh, I wanted to, to add new features to, as I said before, to, to help people experiment with uh, new, new possibilities. Uh, I also wanted to make a software that ha was more friendlier, friendlier with measurable settings, uh, with uh, thing with no more than two or three initial settings that you needed to to adjust to get your first print. So this is what Slicer is now. Slicer is a after one year and a half. It's a it's a major open source software with with a large community. Uh, and um, these are some numbers of, of the project, and uh, I well I, I try to, to keep up with the with the overwhelming amount of feedback and uh, contributions and uh, uh, things to do and new ideas. Uh, this is why I say that this is not additive manufacturing for me; it's addictive manufacturing for me, so, <laughs> because I always keep thinking uh, new ways to to do. Uh, new things. Uh, Slicer started as a personal project and uh, when it turned out that community actually enjoyed uh, using it, uh, I, I had to found, find some ways to support my, my hobby. Uh, so there are spo spontaneous donors uh, clicking on the PayPal button and giving 3 euros or 100 euros, whatever they, they want to. Some people make money from 3D printing, so they say, I want to give something back to you because that this is possible because of your work. Then I also have corporate sponsors. These are some of the main ones. They, they, they make printers, uh, they sell filament, they, uh, uh, they sell other components, and they, uh, they invest in slicer development because the existence of so software for free 3D printing is uh, critical for them and sponsoring an open source project is more convenient than developing in-house solutions, proprietary solutions, because they share the cost, they um, also uh, make uh, advantage of the community, of the spontaneous contributions, uh, and we'll talk about this later. <coughs> uh, so what does Lyser do? Well, basically, uh, you know, we talk about this too many times in these two days, uh, slicer, slicer takes a, a model and makes layers according to a configured layer height. And then for each layer it generates the toolpaths that the printer follows to make that layer. So it makes a bunch of perimeters and then it fills, uh, fills the internal areas according to your settings. And then for each path it calculates the amount of material to push through the extruder uh, to make the trays wider or thinner, for example. Uh, so, uh, let's start from the beginning, and the beginning is whatever you want to print. Whatever, I said. And, uh, so, and you start with an STL file, usually. This is the most common file for printing. Uh, the STL file is it represents a mesh, a polygon mesh, a bunch of triangles describing the external surface of a model. And nothing more than this. So no more information about this, no colors, no, no other things. Uh, one more popular format is OBJ. OBJ is supported by Slicer as well as other software, I think, support OBJ. OBJ rep can represent a mesh. Uh, it represents a mesh with slightly better precision because of the way the OBJ file is written. So I actually recommend usage of OBJ when you have problems with uh, broken STL files. May sometimes exporting in OBJ from a CAD software could may, uh, give better results uh, because of numerical errors. Uh, it also represents surface colors of the of the of the object. Slicer, uh, there is a work in progress to, to support the surface colors. Slicer now supports material colors and not surface colors. Um, then there is the AEMF file. AEMF is a is a it represents everything. Uh, too much. It's a too much complicated mm, format. It represents meshes, so geometry, constellations. So uh, the same geometry. If you want to print the same object multiple times, you have a single mesh description and the constellation of the single object repeated many times, instantiated basically. It represents colors, surface colors and material colors. It represents okay materials. 
uh, region specific requirements for example you could uh, um, say that I want a more a solid region here and I want a, a, a more transparent region there so this format can represent this kind of information it's a standard it's XML based but uh, almost no no cat software is able to export it until uh, well now I think that something is changing something is changing because there is camp software you can read MEF so somebody has to start from either side so um, uh, all these formats have no no uh, units of measurement information in themselves so uh, you have to agree to a convention when exporting uh, our printers always assume millimeters so you model in open SCAD or you model in blender or whatever you model with pure numbers you have to keep in mind that printers will read those numbers as millimeters so what about the output of slicer the output is G code G code is the definition of the single moves that the printer does to to make an object this is a, a preview of the G code of, after slicing um, this is how G code looks like it's a textual file so you have one comment per line it's not that scary if you can you can recognize some initial instructions to set temperature and, and other things and then the fun begins here these are movements so it's like a move to x x x y coordinate move to move to and then while moving to for example x y point extrude some material so it's like a fourth axis added to the machine um, Okay, let's now see uh, uh, the, the first step when you get your printer working and you want to start printing. Calibration. Um, calibration means uh, two things. Uh, there is a firmware calibration and there is a, so a software calibration on the computer side, so uh, the com G code generator slicer. Uh, your firmware, the firmware needs to know some things. It needs to know the dimensions of the machine, so how long are the axes. Uh, where are the end stop positions uh, what, uh, what is the conversion factor uh, between uh, mm, the, 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 mo the motor uh, turns and the length of movement on the single axis of course if you buy a pre-assembled printer they will do this for you but if you build your own you need to tell these things to the firmware you, you have to tell the maximum speed so that the printer does not try to destroy itself uh, you have to configure maximum acceleration because you have masses moving so printer actually accelerates and decelerates on each move um, with, uh, so the, cali the, the most important calibration is uh, the one that converts motor steps these are stepper motors so they turn in steps uh, and millimeters of linear movement you you have two ways of, calcula of, of calculating steps, the, the, the factor between steps and millimeters. For the axis, you calculate the, the, the ratio uh, thanks to, uh, you know, the dimensions of your mechanical components, so it's just, it's just a basic math. Uh, for the fourth axis, the extrusion motor, uh, there is a pro common procedure by trial and error. You, mark, you, you basically mark uh, some distance of your feedstock filament. Uh, you tell the printer to extrude some length, you see what the printer actually extruded and then you do some math to convert to, 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 to uh, fix that uh, factor. So, second part of calibration, the G-code generator, okay, slicer. Um, let's see one basic, uh, basic thing, extrusion width. This is the uh, basic uh, concept of uh, 3D printing. Uh, this is what happens at the tip of the extruder. Uh, you extrude some material which is not just uh, laid out on the uh, previous uh, layer, it's uh, squished with force. Uh, a print, the, all these printers work also in absence of gravity. They can work also upside down. They do not need gravity. Uh, layers are pressed uh, on, the, on the previous one. Uh, according to how much material you extrude, you, you get different widths of traces like like well like with toothpaste you can control how how fat is the trace uh, <laughs> 
Well, actually, I never, I never did that. Um, uh, so this is what happens when multiple traces are uh, laid um, cl close to each other. So there is some overlap to to, to have a, a horizontal um, melt melting. Uh, this is what happens when extrude in free air. Bridges are those parts that do not touch a previous layer, but you can still make unsupported part with these printers if you have two anchors on the two sides. So it's like uh, anchoring a rope on a, on a side and then uh, releasing some of that rope and anchoring on the other side. If the flow is right, temperature is not too high, this works. Uh, so you do not need to put support material on them. And this is the shape that you have of course, it's more, more roundish. Um, uh, what's this for? This is a 3D model. And this is the G-code preview of the, of the model. The, um, let, let's see uh, how the print is made up. C can you see this? Uh, it's not very good. You see, this is a section. You see some uh, perimeters. You see perimeters and in fill. You can you can see how the object is made inside. Uh, as you probably have already heard, models are always printed with uh, some degree of hol hollowness. They are not fully solid. Uh, a 40%, 50% density is enough to, for the model to have any mechanical strength you need. Uh, more infill could also lead to more um, brittleness. Uh, so you save material, you save time, and you get a very uh, mechanically good model. This is a vertical section of this squirrel. N no live squirrel will wear <laughs> cut. So uh, you see the perimeters, you see the different widths of the traces controlled by the software. This is a detail of uh, how the thing uh, works inside. And um, so that was to, to show you the extrusion width. Calibrating slicer means to make the configured extrusion width, so the one you put in slicer or the one slicer calculates automatically for you, coincide with the actual one. So you need to match uh, the, the, the flow to give the computer, to give slicer enough information to control the, the output flow. You take your filament and you measure it very carefully. You take several measures because filaments are not constant, so you take 10 measurements and then you average them. And then you use the extrusion multiplier, which is a factor, a correction factor, and then you put some more, more plastic, you increase that, less plastic, and you decrease that. There are also analytic process, uh, calibration ways, I do not trust them fully because there are too many variables and we, we do not control all of them in our mathematical models. So I like this way of, of uh, calibrating software which is way friendlier. So uh, let's see some, some details, some, some basic concepts of G-code generation. The main setting is layer height. Layer height controls how the layers are thick, so how much the printer goes up before uh, depositing the next one. That, uh, that is the usual range according to your free time, according to your qu desired quality. Uh, then there are perimeters, how much, how many uh, external loops you want. Usually you want to have between one or three loops, they are enough to, uh, to give a good uh, smoothness to the object. Then you decide how, how you want the pattern to be, to be generated and how dense you want it to be. These are the pat available patterns, each one at several uh, densities. So you can choose uh, according to your mechanical requirements, uh, according to your uh, aesthetical requirements. But if you have transparent filaments, <coughs> these are visible, so you can also customize the... These are more... F uh, these are fancier ones. So um, also other important settings uh, are the top and bottom solid layers. You define how many fully solid layers you want on the top and on the bottom to close the, the object. These settings can also be used to make hollow objects, vases for example, from solid objects so that you do not have to uh, hollow them out in your CAD software. You just model a solid and you use slicer parameters to set how thick you want the walls, so the number of perimeters, and you say, for example, 
zero top layers and some amount of bottom layers and you get a base. And then there is support material. For example, you, you want to print this one. There are some parts that are uh, n not printable because they are overhanging, for example, ears. There is nothing where the printer can put filament on, so it will just uh, uh, fall down. Uh, so you have to generate support material. Uh, Slicer and other G-code generators generate autom an automatic support structure it's a scaffolding that you later remove with your hands, with a tool, or with other techniques. Support material looks like this when printed with the same material. It's a very brittle structure. You can just use your hands and a plier and a file and remove it. Or you can use a machine with two extruders and use um, two materials. Two materials with different properties. That, so that, for example, you can combine the um, PLA for the object and PVA for the material. PVA uh, is soluble in water uh, or you can print in ABS and uh, the, the new HIPS filament in, in the new sol limonene solution or you can also mix ABS with, with the wood filament which is quite good for removing with your hands uh, for detaching from ABS. Um, then let's move on to other possible settings. The, these are mm, slicer specific new features. This is what I, I wanted to do back in the days and now I have it finally implemented uh, after implementing all the rest. So uh, you can uh, tell slicer to only generate infill in the areas where it is strictly required to support the ceiling. For example this is a this is the top of a skull, uh, so uh, found a thing yours. Uh, it's like a dome, so you have a more horizontal central par part, which is not self-supporting. So Slicer decided that you only need support in the central part, so you save time and material. Another way to save time and material is to set a thicker infill. Slicer can make thicker layers for internal infill while keeping thin layers in the external so that you get smooth surfaces, smooth look, but save time on printing the internal parts, which will be not visible. Uh, let's now see some common problems. Uh, this is one problem. Uh, objects tend to detach themselves from the build plate. Uh, this happens mostly because there is uh, thermal warping. Thermal warping is caused by non-uniform cooling of the object. I think the picture is self-explanatory. So this is why um, ABS objects in particular tend to warp and to detach themselves. So you have to fight this thing with a number of uh, solutions I'm going to give you. And um, you have to set some first layer specific settings. You can use higher temperature of both the extrusion and the heat pad on the first layer to improve bonding then turn it down for the subsequent layers. You can set lower speed for the first layers. You can set uh, a thicker layer height for the first layer. This also helps for um, uneven beds. Uh, if you want to print a very, a very detailed model and you want to, for example, to have 0.1 millimeters layers you would need to have a build plate leveled up to that tolerance too. Uh, this could be problematic, so you can set the first layer to be thicker. Um, and I suggest to use the maximum allowed height for that one. Uh, and, you set, and you set extrusion width to be to, uh, the twi twice the height, so a very squished uh, form factor of the extrusion, so that is uh, pushed with force. And also disable any uh, cooling fans on the first layer. Mm, there are other things you can do on the heated bed surface, for example you can use some kind of tapes, PT tape, captain tape, uh, you can make ABS juice with, with mm, its ABS with, uh, in acetone, or other glues, for example the one used over there. Uh, you can use hairspray, it works, and, and you have a, a smell in your, in your workshop, uh, except it makes uh, layers, so it keeps increasing uh, thickness on your heated bed, so you have to remove that after some prints. 
Uh, another common problem is uh, caused by th thermal, thermal problems in the print itself. Cooling. After extrusion, plastic has to cool down before the next layer is, uh, is, is made. Uh, if, the, if the previous layer is still too hot when we are making the next one, this is not what we are getting, this is what we should be getting, but we get this one. So the upper one put presses the, 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 the one below, so you get a, a very irregular shape. So this one, this effect. Um, short layers, so little objects or objects with, with pointy features. Short layers have not enough time to cool down before the next one comes. You have two strategies. A negative one, it, it is by using a fan pointed towards the nozzle tip. A passive one, and it's uh, by uh, controlling the speed of the print. So you just speed down to, to have more time between the two layers. Um, the two strategies have an order. First we cool with a fan and then if it's not enough you, you slow down because changing speed in mid-print can cause visible artifacts in the print. Uh, well, okay, don't be scared. It's just, uh, it, it explains what Slicer does. Uh, if you, if you um, take uh, shorter and shorter layers, shorter in terms of time, of printing time, a Slicer will first uh, increase fan speed and up to the maximum and then if it's not enough and you get a, a very short layer it will start to reduce print speed. Uh, another chapter of common issues is the one about dimensional errors. Um, this is the problem. Uh, holes are printed smaller. Uh, you, you design a three millimeter hole for a screw and then it doesn't fit. And this is what I keep hearing. And uh, no, I'm going to show you why. Uh, there are many factors. Uh, for example, plastic shrinks when cooling. ABS shrinks, so you draw a hole and then you have a smaller diameter in the resulting shape. Uh, when, you, when you make a turn and, and you put plastic, you are putting more plastic in the inside. Just like the wheels on the car, which are, are an, an equal lens, so uh, you have more material inside. Uh, another reason is this one. We work with polygon meshes, so our circles are approximated. And, you, and this, if you try to put a screw here, it doesn't work except for some tolerance. So you have to think about this before when modeling, when deciding the number of facets before exporting, for example. Also, uh, filaments are somewhat elastic, so they tend to cut corners. You will never get this sharp, sh this sharpness. They will make a round, rounded path in the corners. And it's not uh, all. There are more problems. Mechanical problems also cause shrinkage, because if you have uneven layers, uh, basically you have the, the, the internal envelope resulting as the maximum uh, diame possible diameter. Another problem is fil bad filaments, cheap filaments having no regular uh, thickness. Uh, they extrude more material, less material, more multi. So you get fatter layers, thinner layers, and still the same problem. So it's not my fault, it's not Slicer fault. <laughs> I, can. Uh, I can give some hints. Uh, adjust plastic. Uh, using extrusion multiplier, so you, you can reduce the, the flow. Just make a little thinner prints and you will get more room for holes. Uh, use good filament, good stable filament. Do not save money on a filament, uh, for other re reasons too. And um, reduce perimeter speed, uh, which uh, reduces the problems about shrinkage, for example. Um, more hints are about designing things and keep in mind the problem about uh, um, circles being made of uh, polygons and maybe compensate for this so, so maybe uh, you, you could consider the hole as um, inscribed in the, in the polygon. There are for example OpenSCAD as a popular uh, module called Polyhole uh, which helps you uh, make correct holes according to what you want in the result. So it, calc it may basically makes an equivalence of the area. Okay, 
uh, this is another chapter. Repairing models, you have you, you, you always have problems with uh, bad meshes when you export something or when you download them. You have corrupt polygon meshes. So this is how our models are represented. Triangle meshes, solid meshes. Solid means that, okay, that they uh, describe a closed solid with no holes. A mesh is solid when it represents a closed surface, it has no holes, it has no self-intersecting faces, so in, for example those ears do not come back inside the object, that would be a non-valid solid. And when each triangular face has exactly three neighbors, no more, no less. This is also known as the model being too manifold, mathematical terminology applied to, uh, to, to solid modeling. Um, for example, this is non-printable, this is just a surface, this is not a solid, you can see the inside. Uh, if you cut a model, and you can do this with, for example, NetFab, um, you, you get a non, uh, an invalid model because you have to close the resulting internal faces, so you have to triangulate them with the same software, but this is not printable because it's uh, open. Um, so possible problems are these ones. Holes Overlapping facets, which means that two facets are in the same position in the space. Uh, inverting normals, uh, so normals are pointing inwards instead of outward, outwards. Self-intersections, these are some examples of uh, problems. These are uh, inverted normals, NetFab shows them in red. Mm, Slicer does not complain too much about self-intersecting models. Uh, it has a way to, to do a reasonable thing with them. But it is very strict about the model being too manifold. So you have to repair it before. No way of expecting any kind of tolerance for it, from, from it. Or you can try OBJ in, the, in some cases. Um, there are some ways to repair STL file. Uh, I, I think Carlo will talk about this, these, some of these techniques later. So I will, I will skip this. Uh, another chapter is this one, printing with multiple extruders on a single machine. You can do several things when you have a multiple head machine. You can print with more than one color, two colors, three colors, and make nice looking objects. You can print with more than one material, as we, as we saw before. You can use a different material for support material and then dissolve it. Uh, for example, you can use different nozzle sizes for uh, rolls for uh, regions in the model. You can do thinner uh, perimeters so that you, you get smoothness and accuracy on the exterior. And you can infill with a larger nozzle, even one millimeter uh, diameter. You can just put material inside. You just need to, to fill your object. So it's a speed gain. Um, you can do two things. You can have uh, an input file which already has the information of uh, separate regions. So you, you design different areas in your uh, CAD software and then import in Slicer and assign these materials to your extruders. Or you can take a normal single material model and assign roles and say do the exterior with uh, one extruder, do the infill, do support material with another one. The format that we use for multi-material files is AMF and some OBJ2 for some things. This is basically how a colored objects come out. You design uh, two groups of meshes. Each one, each material must contain a valid mesh, a solid mesh. So this has to be closed. This is, has to be a mesh on its own then they are merged into an AMF file and then you print them. Uh, you have to keep in mind one thing, if you have uh, your print bed and you have the printable area of first extruder and you have the printable area of the second extruder, because they are uh, somewhat mounted in, uh, along the direction of one, one of the two axes, um, 
the available print area is the intersection of both. Uh, this is why the maker by printer is so large, even by having a, a, a shorter print bed because it has clearance for the mod for the extra motor to go uh, to go outside. Um, uh, soon available, slicer manual. Thanks to thanks to sponsors, uh, some uh, some things are now possible. Um, one is this: a person is um, is being funded to write a complete manual for slicer, uh, which will be ready in the next few weeks. I'm finishing to review the text, and um, it will be also available for translation. It will be released under the GPL license. Um, so it's free documentation. People are free to change it, translate it, sell it, for example. Pro uh, um, also, thanks to sponsors, uh, namely Lulzbot, uh, it is possible uh, for the slicer possible to benefit from an additional programmer. There is a paid programmer in the United States uh, who was a former active member of the community. Uh, he is now working part time. Uh, as a paid job, uh, working on Slicer, uh, developing new features and helping me to uh, put the project um, to, to, new, to new goals. So if you have any questions, I'm here. Okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's a good question. Well, Slicer is quite easy to understand at first glance because it has, I think, reasonable option names. So you have an option called nozzle diameter and you know what you have to put there. Filament diameter and you know what you need to put there. Uh, also, there are other, other sources of documentation. There was another guide made also with the help of Ivan over there in the last months. Um, uh, other, other sources in the community provided guides. Printer vendors provided their own guides. Also, there is a forum. There is a chat channel. If you, if you now log in uh, another chat channel, there is a, uh, a channel with 90 people talking about Slicer and uh, uh, willing to help. Uh, new users, my, myself included. So, what did you learn by mistake also? Oh, sure, and, um, definitely. I, I never, I never tried to uh, to see how other similar software work, uh, and I tried to to implement all the ideas by myself, by of course uh, <laughs> making mistakes and and seeing how the community reacted. Uh, community is wonderful because it's a distribute. It's, it's a huge distributed source of uh, feedback and smoke testing, as we say in programming. Uh, if I commit some, some new features, some badly coded new features before going asleep, the morning I get in my mailbox pictures of failed prints. <laughs> and this is valuable uh, help for me because it's a uh, time saver. So, so this is why Slicer is, is very, very widely adopted in the 3D printing community. Well, it's one of the most popular tests. It is. I'm kind of going to show it later. Oh, he is going to show you later. <laughs> <laughs> this evening we are going to print and to slice our models. So I hope you are all preparing designing 3D models so uh, we can uh, get support from, from these two people. Okay. One, more, one more question. Is there? Sorry, I, I don't know much about this, but uh, when you have to, to, to do the support, so you have to plan the support first, then the real printing that you want to do? That's no, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, you, you could do your, uh, your own, you could make your own support in your CAD software because you know wh what are the, uh, the most, uh, uh, the, the areas where you want less uh, artifacts after you remove the support so you can control better how the support will turn out. On the other hand, uh, support which is automatically generated can be better it will be better. It's an ongoing work because the software knows some things that you cannot imagine. For example, um, you, you, there is no rule of thumb about the maximum overhang angle of a printer. You can say 45 degrees or 30 degrees. Th this is a very general rule because it depends on some flow um, uh, dynamics that the software knows. Basically, the relationship between layer height 
extrusion width and nozzle diameter uh, they, they are the factors which influence the need of support material in that in a place or not so actually it's something that only the software can decide and just to finish just a very and more more mathematical more engineering so uh, is there a problem with vibration for instance the structure or Yes, there are several. There could be several problems in these machines. Uh, when you speed up the print, uh, you will get yes, visible problems. Uh, and then you have the, the cables. And uh, yes, also you you have masses, you have inertia. Uh, so firmware is now control acceleration. New firmwares will hopefully also control maximum jerk the derivative, so uh, still uh, way finer motion control. Uh, there are also other problems in, in printers um, with masses moving, which is resonance. Yeah. Uh, they could start to uh, resonate yeah, yeah. and you skip steps and you have a print that is uh, shifted at some point. This is one common cause of skipping steps. But anyway, this is part of the fine tuning of your machine. Okay. This breaks to four o'clock.